Okay, I'm um, happy to start. Here we go. All right, uh, good morning. Well, I guess it's um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, for me, it's morning. Kind of a weird, strange time, isn't it? I would have loved to be there in person, you know, but with COVID and everything else that we all know that's going on, um, we're doing this over Zoom. I'm pretty familiar with it, with using Zoom. You know, over the past year, I've had to um, teach over Zoom. So I'm pretty comfortable using Zoom, but I much prefer being in the classroom and would much prefer to be um, with you guys there in person, who has ever, you know, in, would love to see Copenhagen, maybe someday soon. But anyway, so um, let's get started. Um, what my talk is and what, what I want like to uh, kind of give, um, you know, an overview of what we've been working on is this idea of hierarchical scheduling. I'll explain what that is in a real, for real-time periodic task in symmetric multiprocessing. The reason why we chose SMP, um, most processing um, elements, most operating systems support provide SMP type based scheduling or resource management in most of their processing elements. So it's very common, you know, a, a way to allocate resources to different, you know, processing cores on the computing system. So that was the main motivating factor behind it. Okay, so um, anyway, I'd like to introduce myself again. My name is Tom Springer. I'm a professor at um, Chapman University in Orange, California. And um, my co-author is Pei Zhao. He was also a professor at um, Chapman University in uh, um, Southern California. Okay, with that being said, let's get started. All right, so basically the overview will be the kind of the motivation, what was our driving factors on you know, starting and continuing to do this type of research. Provide a brief overview for maybe some of you that aren't familiar with what uh, um, SMP-based scheduling is. Um, and then we'll talk about the hierarchical scheduling framework and um, how that plays into our research and then how that's applied to our approach where we took some of those um, methods or approaches to um, apply real-time deterministic behavior to this hierarchical um, scheduling type of framework and then provide some performance analysis that was done and then some conclusions and for future work that we'd like to be um, working on going forward. All right, so basically, um, we looked at it from a cyber physical system type of approach. You know, um, we're more and more cyber physical systems are becoming more ubiquitous in our environment today. And uh, you know, we, there's a, a very strong push for a bunch of different types. Even our cell phones could be considered a cyber physical system and how that applies to specifically the internet of things. Right? There are uh, numerous of internet of things based applications that uh, this type of research could potentially be applied to. Right, you know, we have um, Internet of Things applications in health um, and medical monitoring. We have it in the smart energy grid, and we have it in industrial applications. We have it in transportation and logistics, entertainment, military applications, um, security and surveillance. So there's a lot of areas that um, IoT is um, beginning to, you know, um, enter into, and how that and all that is involved. So that's kind of. Um, part of the uh, motivating factor on why we're doing this, uh, this particular type of research. But there's one maybe factor that I don't know it's being considered, uh, you know, as in depth as it probably should be, is how much data these IoT applications are beginning to generate. So that's kind of what this next slide is all about. So this kind of gives a graph of how much data is being generated by these type of IoT systems. So, um, and these IoT systems are just, again, they're generating data as the graph shows at exponential rates. For example, the Boeing, the new Boeing 787, the Dreamliner, that generates about five gigabytes of data every second. So it's just pumping out tons of information. Other physical, other cyber physical systems like autonomous vehicles, um, they're generating about one gigabyte uh, of data per second. As, and as autonomous vehicles become, you know, more and more prevalent in our society, that data is gonna increase as well. So um, the issue is uh, transmitting all this data into the cloud is going to require tremendous amounts of network bandwidth to the point where it may not even be able to do it. That's what this kind of the splash uh, banner at the bottom says is these IOP based transmissions will very soon in the near future exceed um, current cloud bandwidth. So something has to be done as we continue to go down this IOT path where, you know, just exponentially amounts of data are being generated. So what we started looking at was, well, um, what can we do? So some of the newer research is going into this idea of, well, let's start pushing this stuff closer to the edge. In other words, let's start pushing this stuff closer to the devices that are actually, you know, 
interfacing with the physical environment, the physical part of a cyber physical system. So then what we'd like to do is be able to, you know, maybe push some of that data more towards that edge to keep it out of the cloud. So there's not as much data being transmitted all the way up, you know, the, to the high end servers. In fact, where the first bullet um, indicates is a lot of research is indicated that it might even be unnecessary and even prohibitive. Um, so there's security concerns. So you probably heard in the news recently, you know, there's a couple cyber attacks that happened in the US um, based upon companies that had a network presence that were hacked, right? And that affected um, critical infrastructure. So um, some of the stuff we can keep some of these critical information out of the cloud as best as possible. And again, closer to these edge IoT devices. Another reason why we looked at this the, the too is there's another issue that may not be considered and that is um, there are deterministic there are deterministic requirements. That's what the second bullet's talking about. We have IoT based devices that are control based. So in other words, they have control um, uh, they have control type of requirements. So in other words, they're time critical. So for example, you could be um, talking to some type of sensor and maybe based upon that sensor, you may have to update an actuator. You may have to update that actuator or control that motor within a short period of time. So um, that's another um, component or, rest or restriction that is being hosted upon these type of IOP, IOT based type of systems. And that is again, because um, we have real time requirements. You get a measurement from a sensor where you have to actuate a motor and maybe you only have you know 20 milliseconds or 50 milliseconds to do that. And while that may not necessarily sound like a lot of time, we still have to be deterministic in our approach to it to make sure that we meet those deadlines. So that's kind of what the idea is. So let's put some of these computing, uh, these computing resources closer to the edge, closer to where the data is. Um, for example, they moved to one phase of face recognition application, right? They moved that closer to the edge and that reduced the response time by almost 500%. So if we can continue to do that, now that sounds great, but there's a couple things, there's a couple issues involved. Even though we have, you know, um, embedded processing that's come a long way, like consider the Raspberry Pi, you know, it has an ARM processor, four core ARM processors with the GPU. So these general purpose um, embedded devices are becoming more and more powerful, but they're still nothing compared to, you know, the type of resource um, capable cloud devices are. So, the, um, so while we push things to the edge, there are certain challenges um, that have to be realized to be able to um, take advantage of these type of benefits that moving stuff to the edge can do. So that's kind of what, that's, that's our main motivating factor behind this is taking, how can we better resource manage the um, limited computing resources we have at the edge, even though they're becoming more and more powerful, how can we more um, um, do a better job of managing those resources that we do have available to us? In other words, how can we adapt or um, how can we change to um, unpredictable or unexpected environmental changes? In other words, changes to the physical environment. Also too, as well, it could be things like faults or computer failures, stuff like that. We'll talk more about that in a bit. Okay. so. Um, to apply this approach, our main goal is to provide some type of resource management, particularly IoT computing, specifically um, devices that are close to the edge. So what we're trying to do is develop some type of framework that can get us this type, this type of level of service that's required. Kind of like if you think about like QAS, um, you know, quality of service at a network. We have it in the network, right? The network provides quality of service where, for example, if you know, you're streaming too much video, they may um, throttle your network bandwidth. Right, to be able to provide quality of service to other types of applications. Well, how about if we apply the same type of cost requirements to a embedded processing element where we can maybe throttle back one processing element and maybe provide the type of bandwidth that's needed for another processing element. Like for example, if we have a real time constraint that has to be able to talk to an actuator or you know, to um, drive a motor right, within a certain period of time. Another big one is the second bullet, and that's protect against overloading the edge nodes. Again, these are still limited resource devices. We're not anywhere near the type of resources that the cloud devices have, um, but we, so we'd be able to protect against that. We'd also like to protect against um, faults too as well. Not may, maybe if one particular application is faulting, it doesn't affect every application in the edge. And so some of those issues about overloading edge nodes is, how can we overload edge nodes? Well, one of them, some of these workloads are highly variant. We don't know 
what processing is going to be required beforehand. And then um, another one is typically like when we design embedded systems, we typically design for the worst case. Like for example, a common requirement in industry is when you design the, uh, the resource management of a particular processing element, you typically design for 50% utilization. In fact, it's very common that we'll go through um, requirements design phases and then we have to show our, and you know, prove that we are not using that system more than 50% because of issues like um, overloading. So um, what we can do is instead of uh, engineering for the worst case, maybe we can provide a more adaptable case, right? So can lead to, uh, can provide a more, you know, adaptable case that can take better advantage of the resources that are available to us. And um, the, one of the main reason for this is again, this type of designing for the worst case, which we rarely see by the way, you know, that worst case analysis, WCET is rarely um, realized, but you still have to design for it to be able to, um, um, you know, provide reliability and safety in your system. So, by doing that, we typically over-engineer and we underutilize the resources that are already available and they affect other things like size, weight, power, right? All that kind of stuff. Okay, so what we wanna do is provide a more research uh, management framework that can more effectively adapt to environmental changes, specifically in a symmetric multiprocessor environment. In some of the future work too, we look at asymmetric multiprocessor environments, things like have you know GPUs and stuff like that, but that's for another talk. Um, but for here, we're specifically focusing on SMP. So our approach or our applied approach is a multi-core. So um, a multi-core system and many embedded systems now are multi-core um, to provide some type of scheduling framework for real-time periodic tasks in SMP-based systems. So basically what it does, it takes a, a hybrid approach with traditional scheduling approaches in SMP. I'll talk about those briefly. I have one slide on it. And then it adopts what's known as a hierarchical scheduling framework. We'll talk about what that is for open compositional analysis and temporal isolation. This is important because what you can do is we can guarantee that one particular um, system, talk about how that is defined in a bit, um, can be guaranteed to be schedulable. Um, and if one particular system, and you can kind of think of a system as potentially analogous to an application, can also be temporally isolated from another system. Like for if one system is beginning to fail, it may not affect the outcome or it will be protected from affecting the outcome of another application. So if you have one application that's failing, it's maybe it's non-critical, then that application can be disabled while another critical application can continue to run without the whole system degrading and failing. So <clears throat> let's talk briefly about SMP-based resource management. There's basically two approaches to SMP-based um, resource management, how basically SMP-based schedulers work. And there is, Two types, again, the first type is gold, uh, global scheduling or what's known as non-partitioned. And the idea behind that is it allows tasks to just migrate across cores. So um, a task can be like, for, for example, if one core is becoming overloaded, the operating system will re recognize it and it will move another task that's possibly waiting in the ready queue to be able to access the core and move it to a, um, an idle core. The benefit of that is obviously it's um, better um, average case response time because you're doing load balancing. Right, so you don't have one core that's really busy and a whole bunch of other cores that aren't. So we, so we load balance across multiple cores. So that's um, the idea of global scheduling. There's a disadvantage to this too, and that is the average case performance is not necessarily extended to hard real-time performance. Again, part of this thing is we need to, so we'll, uh, we need to support real-time because we have to provide this deterministic type of behavior. Why can't, why doesn't it support um, real-time behavior? Well, for example, what happens if you have one process that is running on one core, it gets preempted for whatever reason, and the operating system decides to move it to an idle core. Well, if that idle core is a separate core, not sharing the same cache, all that stuff has to be reloaded. We don't know when that's gonna happen. We can't predict when that's gonna happen. That's handled at the um, layer below us. So um, we now are affected potentially by the deterministic behavior that we require to be able to access these things you know, in a real-time manner. So that is a disadvantage of global scheduling. Um, partition scheduling, um, which is where we assign a specific task to a specific core. That's what's known, if you ever heard the term affinity or CPU affinity, that's what that's for, right? And the main thing that is, it doesn't allow task migration. So the task can't migrate across cores. So we could use that to make sure like if there's a deterministic task that we don't want moving to another core, we have his cache invalidated and those type of um, um, 
operations that we have no control over, um, we could utilize that. So this idea here is it binds to the same core. The disadvantage is that back to the same problem, right? Now we have an un unbalanced load distribution. Now we've not fully taking advantage of the resources that we currently have available to us in the system. Um, so there is research been done on both these types of mechanisms in um, SMP and typically for all tasks, you know, whether they're um, um, hard real time or real time or non real time type of tasks, software type of say or non real time type of tasks, not one, neither one of these approaches trumps or is superior than the other. So what may be more beneficial in the type of things that we're looking at is maybe we want a more collective type of resource allocation. And you want to talk about resource allocation. Resource allocation is basically two things, deciding what resources we're going to assign to our particular um, um, computing needs and how they're going to be scheduled. So um, that's kind of what our need here. So uh, we can take a more collective approach. The problem is traditional fine grain schedulers that base that uh, schedule task based on and the task level are not necessarily suitable to this collective type of resource allocation. So that's where we come into um, our approach, which is this hierarchical scheduling processing framework. I'll talk about um, what hierarchical scheduling is a bit, uh, but basically it consists of pretty much three components. For first thing is the um, periodic task model. Um, periodic task model says tasks are going to run and how this is continuing, how many embedded system tasks run, right? It runs continually, it runs forever, and it runs at a specific rate. Like for example, if you're reading a sensor, you typically read that sensor once a second, you know, twice a second, 50 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, whatever the rate may be, you continue to read that sensor over and over and over again. So that's a, you can think of that as a periodic task. So for our um, um, HSP model, we considered periodic tasks only. Some of the future research will look at things like a periodic task, but we'll talk about that later. Another piece of the subset, the sub um, system, you can think of that as an application, right? An application could be one task or it can be a collection of tasks. Um, so it consists of a task set. That's kind of what this is all about, um, of periodic tasks. So again, we're strictly considering periodic tasks, not aperiodic tasks. And again, you can think of an aperiodic task as a task that's running and then somebody comes along and, you know, hits a key at the keyboard, right? So we don't know when that's going to happen. So that would be considered an aperiodic task. That's not considered in this research but it is, it will be in future research. Um, so the study system itself will consider of HEN um, and homogeneous processors. Again, so we're SMP, not uh, um, asymmetric. So we're considering processors all of the same type of a study system that consists of M processors. So basically what we do is we take a multi-core embedded system and we assign um, a subset of the total number of processors to um, our particular subsystem. The benefit or the main goal behind doing this is the, um, we can provide that temporal limit isolation that's required to be able to keep one misbehaving um, subsystem from affecting another misbehaving subsystem. We utilize the multiprocessor resource model. This is a model that provides a bound. This is mainly used to be able to provide schedulability, right? So when we're assigning a particular process to our particular application or subsystem to a core or set of cores, we use the model to make sure that they're schedulable. Right? If they're not schedulable, then we just can't, we can't do it. So either an application has to be removed or um, a, a lower priority application or a lower priority task in that application may not get to run. And then the last piece is the hardware scheduler. So those are the main components that make up HSP. And so let's talk about hardware scheduling. Hardware scheduling is kind of a framework. And the way it sets up is there a global scheduler that controls which application or subsystem actually gets to run right, on the uh, selection of processing cores. And what's unique about um, hierarchical scheduling is you can separate out, and that's another benefit of it too, is you can separate out each particular um, subsystem from the overall system itself and the global schedule controls it. So if this particular subsystem has zero is misbehaving, it's not gonna affect other subsystems. Another benefit is you could have different scheduling mechanisms. Like for example, subsystem S1 could use EDF, right, earliest deadline first scheduling, well, subsystem two can use rate monotonic and maybe subsystem three could use round robin because it has its, you know, very response time and less concerned about um, other, um, you know, issues like determinism. 
Another big thing is to kind of keep in mind is how scheduling provides us temporal uh, isolation against task overload. Because for example, if you overload in an earliest deadline first system, you result in what's known as a domino effect. It can affect all other task deadlines. So the idea being is if we have an overloaded task in subsystem zero, we don't want it to affect other tasks in other subsystems. In rate monotonic, um, all our priority tasks can start missing their deadlines, right? So that's not the behavior that we want to, um, we want to be able to control. So this is our basic H, um, HSP architecture. It takes advantage, it, uh, takes advantage of both kind of, uh, as I mentioned in a previous slide, it's, it's a hybrid approach to how we schedule tasks on and how we allocate resources in a system. So basically we break the task up, they have to be identified a priori, what the hard real-time tasks are and what the soft real-time tasks are. So we break those up and then this task set gets assigned to a particular subsystem. That subsystem consists of, again, a subset of the total number of cores on the system. So um, the local scheduler controls each particular subsystem and then the global scheduler controls which subsystems get to run. And of course they run on this multi-core um, SMP based multi-core processing platform. The thing to note is that H, um, HRT tasks, hard real time tasks are partitioned, right? So they're not allowed to migrate because we can't deal with the undeterministic behavior when a task migrates from one core to another. And then, um, but the soft real time tasks, they're allowed to migrate across because we're not as concerned about the type, you know, about um, that type of behavior. So the, in this way, now we can maybe more fully utilize higher utilization of the processing cores than strictly one um, type of SMP scheduling over another. So this kind of gives a, the, the idea of processor assignment. So here's an example task set. So like you set this, the, set this example of a task set. So like we have, for example, um, tasks um, one, two, three, and four, those are partitioned. So those are, those are assigned specifically to a specific core. They're determined whether, um, how they're assigned using the multiprocessor research model. Right, and then the rest, um, the um, task five, six, and seven, they're considered soft real-time tasks, and those again, those will be identified by the developer beforehand, and those get assigned um, as so they're allowed to migrate across cores in the subsystem. Um, so the kind of the idea of task scheduling, how it worked. Let's kind of go back here. So another thing I want to talk about too, real quick, is this idea of task splitting. It's not, a, it's not a new term, it's been used in other type of approaches. So the idea being is if like, for example, if one task can't complete its execution on the one core, if it's a global task, then it can be split to run on another core. So another thing that gets taken advantage of with this is this, this idea of known as slack. So you take this idea, for example, um, task T1. Well, if we look at task T1, it's worst case execution time is set at two units, whatever those time units may be. Well, maybe it doesn't use it. Maybe it uses its average or its low um, worst case utilization time. Well, then that generates some slack. And the idea behind that is now we could potentially utilize that slack um, for a non real time task to be able to improve the response time of non real time tasks as well. So for example, in this case, this is how a particular task may be scheduled across these two cores that make up this particular subsystem. Okay, um, so some performance analysis, what we did, this is uh, performance analysis of, um, we applied it to, you know, how a particular task could be assigned. So we, uh, um, we took, uh, combined the soft real time and hard real time tasks, ran them across subsets of two, four, and eight cores. Task periods are chosen as a random um, distribution list, as you know, at 0.25 hertz and so on. <clears throat> Overall system utilization averaged from about 50% to one fully utilized in increments of 0 0.05. And we compared those against other similar petitioning algorithms, which are used in mixed criticality systems as well. Mixed criticality means that there's systems that are hard real time and soft real time. So we look and I apologize that slides aren't that great. I tried to make the resolution better, but these were done in GNU plot and they don't transfer over really well. But the idea be here, if you look at the bottom, you can see that HSP in across all cores, two, four, and eight cores, you see across them, they started to um, actually, you see the performance starts to, uh, you know, it, it provide better schedulability across two or four cases as opposed to the other standard mixed criticality scheduling systems. 
Okay, so it's implementation. We also implemented this. We implemented this in VxWorks um, um, 6.9. We implemented the um, um, Iroco real-time scheduler. This is a basic overview of what the um, updates to VxWorks were done. Kind of comment, I'll talk about this in a bit, but a big part of it was that um, we ran it on top of VxWorks, not within the kernel itself. We utilized kernel, the kernel module and some of the the hooks that are allowed into the operating system. This provides a type of data structure that was um, updated to support it because we wanted to see how it actually worked in a real, real-time operating system. So we took a simulated platform. It was run on a Freescale PowerPC T4240 communications processor. This is a multi-car processor running VxWorks 6.9. We utilize this new real-time benchmark, compared response time to an overall system utilization to partitioned non-partitioned, and hierarchical scheduling. We had the task sets were um, assigned as accordingly as this, and we ran the system. So you can see here for hard real-time tasks, the response time is pretty consistent. So uh, the results were fairly encouraging. So you can see the uh, results were pretty consistent as, co as opposed to con uh, standard partitioned or um, non-partitioned type scheduling. Notice is CPU utilization gets about 0.6 which makes sense because that's the rate monotonic deadline. That's the theoretical limit of rate, mono, uh, rate monotonic deadline. The other, the other um, scheduling approaches don't perform as well at all. And then if we look at the soft real-time task, we can do also, you see that the response time is even a little bit better because of things like slack stealing that soft real-time tasks are allowed to use. So the performance is a little bit better um, than um, the other traditional um, partitioned or um, non-partitioned type of scheduling. So for future work, um, we like to evaluate the overhead that HMP occurs in VxWorks. Um, so that's one of the approaches is we'd like to transition over to 7.0. VxWorks 7.0 provides the actual now the um, Wind River, the manufacturer of the RTOS, provides the source code. So now we can actually get into the, um, the levels of the kernel itself. If you have a license to it, you can change the code. It wasn't that case. You, you, were, you provided library binaries without, unless you got special permission. Um, so it's going to make it easier to integrate the kernel. Um, tasks as well as task sets are considered to be completely independent for no shared resources. That was another thing I didn't mention, but these are independent tasks. We're not sharing semaphores, right? So we specifically didn't do things like semaphores. How would semaphores and things of mutual exclusion affect our HP scheduling? And then um, the last piece was um, we'd like to evaluate performance benefits by implementing um, uh, HSP into the kernel, again, by using um, 7.0. So that's some of the uh, future areas that we'd like to take this work. And um, thank you for everybody listening. I ran over a little bit, but there was a lot to talk about. So if anybody has any questions, 